before we get started, I would like to do a, a land acknowledgement as I look around in beautiful Victoria, where I'm conducting this Zoom from. And I want to acknowledge that it is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sonnies, the Squamo, and Wasanich people. All right, so Natasha, without further ado, welcome. Um, and let's just get started by perhaps you sharing with me a little bit about who you are. Just tell me about yourself and uh, let's give everyone who's joined this, this Zoom an idea of who Natasha Byrne is. I would love to. I wanna start just by saying that I feel really honored to be here uh, and that I have the privilege to have a voice in this matter and to have a lot of people who want to hear what I have to say. And I wanna thank everyone for being here today to hear me. Uh, my name is Natasha Fernley. On a personal level, I am uh, energetic, caring extrovert. I love connecting with people on a deep level. Personally, I have very little filter. I'm kind of an open book uh, and very emotional. I, I'm a heavy crier. My coworkers have seen me cry talking about the things I'm passionate about. And I've just learned to be really comfortable being vulnerable and authentic. And I'm really learning about the value of that as a human, because I love connecting with other people and seeing them mirror that vulnerability back to me and then that allowing me to have those deep conversations with other people. Uh, and professionally, I am a registered nurse. I have a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And at Theracil, I am the clinical intake director here. And I consider myself a psychedelic medicine educator, advocate, and just general enthusiast. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I'd also love to hear, and of course I know this, but please share, how did you get into this work? How does, how does a nurse get into supporting so many people with access to psilocybin? I really feel like everything I've ever done in my life has led up to this. I've always had a strong interest in psychology, even as a young child, kind of hanging out with my friends and kind of reflecting on why they're the way they are and how they're feeling about things. And then like most people who kind of get into this work, I have my own traumas, my own story from my childhood. Uh, and, you know, I got into uh, trying to take anti-anxiety medications as a young teenager. They, those made me feel better, but I wanted to find another route to feeling like grounded in myself. So I started doing sleep hypnosis, started doing meditation, started doing yoga. Um, and then I got into nursing school because I just wanted to connect with people. Uh, and while I was in nursing school, I was thinking like, did I make the wrong decision? I was angry about the Western medical model, uh, angry about how they didn't see the human as a whole person with their psyche involved, that they were pushing pharmacology. Uh, and reflecting back now to nursing school, it's funny that before I even knew anything about psychedelics, before I knew this would be my career path, I did a, a literature review on complementary and alternative therapies for cancer patients. So I kind of was always on this path. I just didn't even know it yet. And after I finished nursing school, I started a career working in uh, long-term care facilities, working with patients with dementia and helping patients at end of life with palliative care. And that was where I really began to appreciate that life is not limitless, uh, really began to feel honored to be with people in their last moments of their lives. And also I discovered my skill for holding space for other people because when I work with people with dementia, it's so similar to someone who is on a psychedelic. You know, you meet them where they're at, you hold space for them, you keep your nervous system calm for them. And I just really discovered my appreciation for end of life and altered states through that work as a nurse. And then in early 2017, I had my own psychedelic transformative experience in which I listened to a podcast that talked about the healing power of psychedelic mushrooms. I happened to have some mushrooms at my house. Um, literally the podcast was still playing on my headphones. They were like wrapping it up and I ate a couple mushrooms uh, and I had a transformative experience. And after that, I just became obsessed with learning, um, getting involved in psychedelic conferences, volunteering at psychedelic organizations, doing harm reduction, doing all the courses I could do, reading everything I could. And I kind of built this 
second life. I had my career as a nurse and I had my career or second life doing psychedelic harm reduction, learning, teaching. Uh, and then I was so lucky to connect with Bruce Tobin and Spencer, our CEO, and they brought me onto Theracil and I got to kind of combine my two worlds into one. That's, that's my story of how I ended up here. That's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's almost like a year ago or just over a year ago that, that I first heard about you from some friends at BAPS, the Victoria uh, Association of Psychedelic Science. So um, we're super lucky at it from that point, right when we were first working with uh, the first couple of clients, um, people in need of access to psilocybin, it was evidently clear that we needed a nurse to work with them because although there are no regulations on psilocybin, acting out what would be good regulations was, was the idea of the organization. And so finding a nurse was just a no brainer, right? Who better mm -hmm. to, to care and work with patients and understand their ethical duties around people who are uh, looking to access something like psilocybin than a nurse. So we're incredibly blessed to have you. Um, and, and nurses really do play a huge role in, in psychedelic access, specifically psilocybin, friend of life and beyond. Um, so in that sense, I'd love to hear about your uh, role as clinical intake director at Therasil. Uh, uh, tell me a bit about it and why it's, why it's important. Yeah, like reflecting on when we first connected, uh, Spencer and I, uh, he brought on me and my friend and colleague, Josie Sanderson, another RN, and we began to help Spencer and Bruce build the first iteration of the clinical intake. Uh, and they had the base of bringing pa patients through the process, but I really feel like the nursing lens that Josie and I brought to the building of the beginning of the intake was what was needed, right? Uh, and now I'm lucky that I've kind of transitioned into the clinical intake director position here now, and I'm constantly working on the evolvement improvement of our clinical protocol, which is like the entire system of how we bring patients through uh, from the first time they reach out on our website to uh, bringing them through to have assessments done, educating the patients, making sure that they're, they're the right fit. Uh, we assess their medical background, their psychological background, their social history, their, their uh, psychedelic use history. We start to build trust with the relation with the patients and build relationships with them. And we, uh, me, myself, as the clinical intake director, as well as the clinical intake specialist or patient intake specialist that I work with. Some of us uh, are RNs, some of us are social workers. Uh, we bring the patients through, communicate with physicians all over Canada, uh, request that these physicians help patients to apply for their Section 56 exemptions, which is the exemption that gives them legal access to use psilocybin. And we coordinate with those physicians to ensure that there is no counterindications for these patients to per be pursuing psilocybin. And once the patient is through all of the assessments, once we know it's safe, once we support them, uh, I and the other patient intake specialists help them to apply for their Section 56 exemptions. Uh, we communicate with Health Canada. We advocate for them through our communications with Health Canada. And if these patients are granted their Section 56 exemptions, like 31 patients have been so far, we connect them with the therapy team, which is therapists that have been trained through Theracil's training uh, modules. And we even track them until treatment is completed. So we're, we're really following the patient and overseeing and advocating for them, ensuring they're safe through the entire process. Uh, and on top of that, I'm really excited that I get the opportunity in this role to ensure that the healthcare practitioners that are collaborating with us, that are going through our training, understand Theracil's clinical protocol and understand how they will collaborate with us and help to ensure that they're being taught how they're gonna take on referrals. And just all of it really is around patient safety. That is my job, ensuring that these patients are safe and this is appropriate for them and that they're supported. And yeah, that's, what, that's my goal. That's excellent and you know, <laughs> I don't think bias as much as just informed, but my, my mom was a nurse growing up. And so I, I completely understand that, you know, in a way nurses are the glue that holds healthcare mm -hmm. system together. Uh, you know, obviously we, we tend to look at doctors as, as perhaps the only ones working directly with patients and helping them, but it is, it is the nurses uh, that are doing 
equal equal work in that making sure the patients are fully supported and tended to and cared for it it, it really is such an important role and, and you've certainly helped show me that um yeah. and, and i completely agree with everything you're saying i don't know how we how we do this without you natasha um mm -hmm. so I, i'd love to jump in a bit about your your personal experience like your, your journey with psilocybin um and i'd love for you to share as, as much or little as you'd like with with me and everyone about, about what that session was like. Um, and, and to be clear, you have used psilocybin um, now legally through section 56 with our training program. Um, so I'd love you to, to just tell us about that, uh, you know, why it was important and what your experience was like and how it might have, might have helped you with your work. Yeah, this is the juicy stuff. It's pretty exciting that I get to, as a professional nurse with my job, share with people this experience. This is so unique uh, and so exciting. I got my own Section 56 exemption in December of 2020, along with 18 other healthcare practitioners. And in February of 2021, a couple months later, uh, Therisil started its first training cohort. And so I'm really lucky that I got to be in that first group of practitioners going through Therisil's training uh, for psychedelic psychotherapy. And through that journey, I had the opportunity to start to learn about the importance of the psychotherapeutic container and the, the model that the research has modeled for us that we now take and ensure that patients are going through. And there, it's the model that I have got to go through myself. So we separate this into three sections, right? Uh, there's the preparatory sessions which ensure that the patient has a chance to, you know, build trust with the therapist, talk about what might come up for them, uh, learn about what might happen on the session day, and just do so much work beforehand, so much counseling to prepare for the medicine day. Uh, and through my training, I had the opportunity to do that with two trained uh, therapists who were in the training as well. So I had so much opportunity to really prepare myself for this journey day. And then on the medicine day, after I was prepared and I built trust with my counselors, um, I had built intentions. So my two intentions were originally number one was to allow them to hold space for me uh, because I've been in situations before in which I felt uncomfortable letting people care for me. You know, I feel guilty. I'm worried that I'm making a mess. I'm kind of not letting my guards down completely. So I had the intention of allowing that, allowing them to hold space. And my second intention was to reflect on my own mortality. Um, I've worked as a palliative care nurse for a long time. I've been with patients, you know, at their last moments of their lives, but I've never ever honestly thought about what if that was me? What if I was the one in that situation? And so I spent like weeks journaling and reflecting on if I had, this a diagnosis and I was in the situation that the patients I care for was were in, um, what would happen? And I think that honestly, I would probably curl up in a ball and be anxious and be depressed and be scared. Uh, and it would be really, really, really hard. Uh, but through reflecting and going into my journey with those reflections, um, I really started to, well, let me go back a bit. So uh, I had the session day with Anne Marie and Adrian, and we, you know, put, had an opening ceremony. I drank the mushroom tea. I uh, put on eye shades. I had music, and I went into my experience. Uh, and I had, you know, change in consciousness. I saw visions. I had ideas. It's like so many things that I couldn't. It's ineffable, right? You can't describe it. But through that experience. I really started to understand that this psilocybin experience for patients is a chance for them to practice being vulnerable, a chance for them to practice being cared for, a chance for them to surrender. Um, and it's all about being witnessed, being witnessed in what you experience, being able to speak about what's happening, uh, because I've been learning a lot about trauma lately and learning that Trauma is not what happens to us, but it's what happens inside of us. And it's when we're alone with that, with those feelings and we can't express them. So this safe container that was developed is a safe place for me to practice being vulnerable, practice being cared for, 
and to have people witness my story and my feelings, which is beautiful. I also reflected a lot during my journey on uh, the stories that were told, the stories in our life, the stories in our society, and how growing up in society, you know, there's stories and narrations all around us. Um, and we're kind of always living the story that we understand, the story that we were told. And we have this inner narrator in our mind, this everyone or most people, I think, have a voice in our head that is always kind of speaking to us and narrating our lives. It's telling our story. Um, and sometimes that narrator gets stuck in a dark story, a scary story. They feel alone. They don't feel witnessed in their story. Um, and I reflected on my own inner narrator. Uh, and I also reflected on time and that these patients who I'm caring for have a limited time left in their life. Uh, they're aware of that limited time. And I reflected on how it's not that the, it's the length of time we have, it's really about the quality of our time. Um, and so I've been reflecting a lot since then when I, has I been integrating on um, my own life and with these insights about using time wisely about how if I am able to be aware of my inner narrator, uh, tell my story and myself and my own life in a beautiful way that supports me and is empowering. And then I use the best of the time that I have available to like be my best version of myself and be grounded. Then I am more able to care for the patients that I care for and help them to do that as well, to, to be there for them so that they can hopefully through psilocybin use or through counseling, learn to use the best of the time they have that they have available to just, you know, love the people they love and do things that make them happy and try to not be swallowed by the fear of an end of life diagnosis, even though that's completely understandable and expected with what they're going through. Um, it's, so much easier for people to find some little bits of beauty in their life when they feel supported and seen uh, and they can feel as though they're in community, which is what this psychedelic psychotherapy provides for people. Um, yeah. It sounds pretty ineffable in a way it too, is. right? Like I, it is. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but uh, just to, to really boil this down to, I think what's incredibly important is, is acknowledging that more or less everyone seems to have their own experiences. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say from, from, from yourself and certainly the other people in the training program, would you say these experiences were positive and did what, what we were hoping that they would do, which is teach the people who are working with patients, uh, you know, how to work with those patients who are going to be taking psilocybin and to be able to communicate with them better and have more empathy. Do you think it did that? Did it make you a better you know, that intake nurse. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. There's, there's no way that I could do my job and I could be talking to patients every day and educating them about psychedelics and preparing them about psilocybin. If I had no understanding of what it really was like to have that experience, that it, it would be almost unethical for me to be telling them about this and encouraging them or educating them without my own experience. Uh, and also just the understanding of the importance of the therapeutic container as well, because people are desperate for healing and they may be going out and wanting to do psilocybin on their own, but having this experience really makes it clear that it's important that patients understand why it's important that they have the therapeutic container and they have the counselors that are going to support them. Um, and it's also informing my clinical protocol development, informing how to bring people through our process. Um, and I'm the first contact with patients and I'm talking to them. And when I can disclose also that I've had this experience, there's this greater sense of trust between the patient and me. Uh, why would they feel trusting of what I have to say if I haven't had this experience myself? So there's For so sure. many, so much value. For sure. And so maybe that like almost makes this next question to Revlin, but like if, if more nurses are interested in working with patients with psilocybin and so psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, is it safe to say that it's important to not demand, but offer similar experiences that you've had to other nurses who want to support their patients with, with access to psilocybin? Oh, definitely, definitely. And it's not even just about 
um, nurses who are there during the time in which the psilocybin is consumed. It's not even about nurses who are doing direct roles like mine. It's all nurses. All nurses are interacting with patients on a daily who may be interested in these medicines, who may um, be talking about pursuing it. And if you're not able to really educate a patient about what this means, and the, there's so much value in really being able to explain to patients how this stuff works. And it's really hard to do that without your own experience. Absolutely. Now, this is just something too that's, uh, I think, apparent is that the Section 56 process as you see it, and, and the one that has given both you and your your peers, your colleagues, access to psilocybin for professional training and to about 30 patients as well. Um, is this Section 56 process enough? Is it helping the patients that need help? Is it helping uh, the nurses and doctors and therapists that need access to training? Right now it isn't enough. Uh, we have, I think it's 12 patients right now who are waiting to hear back from Health Canada. And I've seen patients who are waiting a hundred days, they're, they have palliative diagnoses or they're in remission from a diagnosis that was traumatizing and life-threatening. And they're in even more distress because they're waiting on these exemptions. Uh, there's just so much more we could do for people if this was more accessible, well, definitely. For sure. It seems quite arbitrary too. Uh, you know, why, why do you get access and, and not the other nurses, therapists, mm -hmm. and doctors who have made application? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense that Health Canada decided to give me a Section 56 exemption, you know, in December. Uh, but we have all of these practitioners who are in training who need to support the patients that I'm bringing through my process. Uh, and these patients I'm bringing through my process, like I said, I want to ensure they're safe. I want to ensure that they have the right care. I want to ensure that they're finding healing through this and they can't do that if there's nobody to provide them the treatment. And so we, we need practitioners to be given these exemptions, but even further than that, the exemptions aren't enough. We need to do this in more bulk. We need, we need regulation and legalization so that we can train people even more because this is something that people are doing anyways. And we need them to be able to do it in a safe container. So uh, around the topic then of like this safe container, um, mm -hmm. you know, what would your message to the government or to Patty Hyde be regarding like, you know, some form of regulation that would mm -hmm. allow people better access than Section 56? What would you say to, to Patty? I would say, Patty, we need a doctor as a gatekeeper model. Uh, the people at Health Canada who are pro providing these exemptions aren't the experts. They shouldn't be telling Canadians whether they can have access to this or not. It should be the doctors who are informed and educated on this should be able to prescribe this for their patients. Uh, and you should trust that physicians and therapists who are, who are the experts in this know whether a patient should have access or not. Okay, so you're saying maybe get to something where it's a little less arbitrary and where mm -hmm. there's you know doctors and therapists being consulted a bit, a bit maybe like, I don't want to say it's the same as cannabis or or medical assistance in dying or something like that, but but put it in the in the power of the doctors and therapists, not not mm -hmm. so much the minister or government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a doctor's responsibility to only do what's within their scope. That's part of their practice. Same with nurses, same with therapists. So no doctor should be prescribing psilocybin unless they feel like they have the ability to do so. And so we need to train them. Um, and so either they need Section 56 exemption so we can train them or we need to give them legal permissions in some other manner. Well, thank you, Natasha. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to switch over to questions from the audience now, as I realize we've only got five minutes and I, I know we we're supposed to do that in 10, but uh, super interesting and really, really good to hear about your experience and your thoughts on this. So thank you. And I'll pass it over to Holly Bennett to ask some questions that the audience members have been submitting and posting in the chat box here. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, we're, gosh, we always seem to run a little bit um, tight on time. So I think we might have to do a part two if you're cool with that, Natasha, but I will ask a few that came through prior um, to this webinar. Um, so what would be 
the role of nurses right now as we stand in Canada and in the future from your perspective in the uh, psychedelic therapeutic context? Uh, the, so the role of nurses right now is really a harm reduction approach. Uh, there are, you know, roles like mine, but they're few or far in between. There's ketamine clinics in which that's legal and nurses can provide therapy there. But really the role of nurses right now is education and harm reduction because people are doing these psychedelic medicines, these psychedelic treatments on their own uh, outside of the therapeutic container. And nurses are you know, directly interacting with patients in hospital, in community, and they need to be educating people about how to do this safely to ensure that people aren't being harmed and that they're finding healing because they don't have access to the therapeutic container right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for nurses who are interested in getting involved in this type of work, either now or in the future? How can one kind of prepare for hopefully imminent legalization of, of psilocybin? Yeah, I would say like learn, learn, learn as much as you can. Um, I started through volunteering, doing harm reduction, uh, join your local psychedelic community. Um, if comfortable, like start talking openly about this with your friends or your colleagues. Uh, find out like You'd be surprised how many people are really interested in this. And every single time you're talk talking openly, you're um, normalizing it and destigmatizing this. Uh, there's so many good books out there. There's start looking at the research, watch all the videos. There's courses available. Uh, go to conferences, network, uh, just build community around you of people interested in this and opportunities and things will fall into your lap. Awesome. Thank you, Natasha. Um, and we'll do the last question here before I pass it back to Spencer. Um, have you had any issues with your regulatory body in regards to this? Yeah, if I'm being completely honest, I've never uh, gone to my regulatory body and said, hey, are you okay with this? I've heard through the grapevine rumors that they're quietly supportive. Uh, but when I have um, renewed my license, I put on there that my employer is there still. I know that with my work that I'm doing, I'm completely within my scope of practice. I'm doing everything legally and ethically. Um, and honestly, it would be irresponsible of the college for them not to support this work because of patient safety. Nurses need to be doing this. Um, and I'm optimistic that there could possibly be in the future some sort of extra certification for nurses around psychedelics through the colleges. That is my hope. Awesome. Thanks, Natasha. I am mindful of time. So I'm just going to pass it back to Spencer um, just to talk a little bit about how you can support Therisil if you're interested. Um, we do have a fundraiser going on now. So Spencer, do you mind uh, quickly talking about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and first of all, I think that I have to say thank you to everyone who's on this call right now and, and all of those who couldn't make it, um, but might be watching it or supporting from, from you know, the sides and that side of this call. Um, the only reason that people like, you know, or not the only reason, but one of the biggest reasons that people like Natasha and the patients that we've been supporting uh, have been getting access to psilocybin is because of the overwhelming support from their fellow Canadians and, and, and all of the people who are, you know, rooting for psilocybin access across the world. Um, so it, it may seem uh, like you, you're a drop in the ocean or something, but things like sharing um, you know, this news, uh, sharing stories about patients who have been waiting for 100 days for access, tweeting at the minister, um, all of this stuff creates the sort of public pressure that unfortunately is necessary, or seems to be necessary in Canada to get people access to psilocybin. Um, so at Therisil, so we're going to continue to support patients and healthcare practitioners who need access for training um, and treatment. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and we're dedicated to continuing to be their voice. Um, we've got a fantastic Minister of Health, Patty Hyde, too, um, and an excellent, you know, Exemptions Department of Health Canada that, that have done a lot, but it needs to be acknowledged that, that more work needs to be done. Um, that Section 56 may not be, you know, the, the perfect solution. Um, and that as we approach a time where, you know, we're starting to see that there are so many other nurses and doctors and therapists and patients with, with different indications that need access to psilocybin, 
that a real solution is needed, one that's less arbitrary. So this is certainly what we're working towards as an organization is to connect doctors and patients um, with the government and, and to inform you know, policy that, that is able to support Canadians instead of leaving this to you know, the courts to decide what gets done. Uh, we live in Canada uh, and, and this amazing country, we should be able to work with the elected officials such as Patty Haidu um, and her and her team and, and the Liberal Party to support patients and doctors, not to fight them tooth and nail, um, especially when they need access to medicine. So really, everyone, thank you so much for attending this. Thank you for your support. Um, if you can, please donate to our fundraiser. Um, it's matched and, and it's going to go towards the exact work that we've been doing, continuing to support patient exemptions, help patients get treatment, to advocate for them and to support training so that we can get more nurses, more therapists, more doctors, access to psilocybin safely supported. So really, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know from the bottom of everyone on the Theracils team's heart and all the patients that uh, are the clients that, that, that we've been supporting, it, it means so much. So, so thank you. Thanks, Spencer. Natasha just slacked me asking if she could say one more thing. So I'm just going to quickly pass it back to her and then we'll wrap up because I don't like going over time, but Natasha, please go. <laughs> Yeah, so I just really wanted to advocate for nurses. Like we're here to talk about nurses and I feel like I didn't have a chance to say like, nurses are the ideal profession to do this work, right? The ideal team is one therapist, one nurse and nurses are the experts at meeting patients where they're at, uh, at caring for patients. We spend so much time at the bedside holding space for people. We're the experts at holding space for people. We have a unique position where patients trust us. People feel safe with nurses. They feel safe to talk about everything, their body, their medical stuff, their history. We're used to meeting the whole family. Um, and we are the connection to the medical field and the medical knowledge that the therapists don't have and don't understand. And these patients that are coming through, they're medically complex individuals. So nurses need to be there with these therapists to connect them, make sure patients are safe. Um, and we're just, nurses have always been the leaders in healthcare, uh, and we're not stopping now. We're going to be the leaders in the psychedelic renaissance. Uh, and I just wanted to be like, woo, nurses rock. We're here. We're not going away. Uh, and we're, uh, we're leading this movement. That's all I wanted to end with. I second that. Nurses rock. Thank you so much, Natasha. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth, for joining. <laughs>